Hi everyone, today we're discussing estuaries or estuarine depositional environments. First, like we always do, I'm going to show you on this source to sink diagram where estuaries lie and they are in this yellow circled area. Estuaries receive sediment from both fluvial and marine sources and therefore this is going to be a large part of the discussion when we go over what kind of deposition is going to occur and what kind of stratigraphy we might expect in an estuarine sequence. So let's get into some background over estuary classification. There are four different types of estuaries shown here in this figure. We have coastal plain estuaries, which are formed by erosion by rivers. Then we have bar-built estuaries, which are formed because of barrier bar formation, which is a wave-dominated system, which we'll see in the next few slides. Then we have tectonically formed estuaries, and then finally glacially formed fjord estuaries. And the geometry, deposition, and processes that occur in estuaries is very dependent on the relative tidal, fluvial, and wave influence. For example, on this figure, we can see that going from left to right, it goes from more tidally dominated to the middle, which is fluvially dominated, to more wave dominated at the right. Additionally, the geometry processes and deposition in estuarine environments is also dependent on transgressive and regressive occurrences, and we'll talk about this later in the lecture, and then also density differences between the sediment source and and the basin water, which we'll talk about also later in the lecture. So first, let's talk about the geometry and what controls the geometry of estuaries. We can see that in this figure, we have wave-dominated estuaries in the order of increasing tidal influence going from lagoonal to partially closed to open-ended estuaries. And then we have tide-dominated estuaries called tidal estuaries. We can see that the geometry in wave-dominated estuaries is shore parallel, whereas the geometry in tidal dominated estuaries is shore normal, so parallel to the shore rather than perpendicular or normal to the shore. Then we have the formation of bars. Wave dominated systems form barrier bars by longshore currents, again distinguishing wave dominated systems with that shore parallel geometry. And then we have tide dominated systems which form tidal bars and tidal ridges caused by tidal currents, which again are normal or perpendicular to the shore. Lastly, for geometry, we have lagoons. Lagoons typically form when there is some sort of barrier bar causing the accumulation of water behind it. And in lagoons, they can either be fed by marine and fluvial sources or just marine. When lagoons are fed by both fluvial and marine sources, we call these lagoons. However, when lagoons are fed by marine sources only with no river source, these are technically classified as bays. So now that we have some of that classification, terminology, and geometry out of the way, let's get into the deposition and processes in estuarine systems. Like we talked about previously, we mentioned that the density of the inflow versus the basin water will influence the deposition in estuary environments. Luckily, there's only one flow type that is typical of estuarine environments, and other environments like deltas differ greatly. This makes it easy to distinguish estuaries from other depositional systems in the rock record. For example, estuaries are dominated by high hypopycnal flows. Hypopycnal flows are flows where less dense water flows into a denser water body. This is typically caused because the salinity in estuarine basins is greater than the fluvial inflow because of the marine influence. However, where fluvial inflow is dominant and you have deltas forming and building out further offshore due to progradation, these are typically dominated by hyperpycnal flows. Hyper, not hypo. And these hyperpycnal flows are flows in which the incoming flow is more dense than the water it is flowing into. This is typically because the fluvial source has a high sediment load and this causes turbidity flows, which will be discussed in the submarine fan video. Additionally, I discuss more about deltas and the processes behind delta deposition in the deltas video. And lastly, if you want to go back and look at the lacustrian video, you can learn a little bit more about the deposition and sedimentary structures that form due to each different type of inflow event. Hypo, hyper, and homopycnal flows. But for this video, let's move on to how sea level affects estuarine deposition. Sea level rise and fall can play a large role in determining the geomorphology of estuarine systems. The estuary is preserved due to transgression, but during regression gets eroded because it is overwritten by fluvial processes. To show this, we have this figure to the bottom left. What we can see is this is during a transgression, which is when the shoreline moves further inland, as opposed to a regression 
regression when the shoreline moves further basinward. The shoreline moving further inland or transgression can be due to a rise in sea level. And when the sea level rises, we get this wonderful estuary environment to form if all of the marine, fluvial, and tidal influences are balanced to where an estuary would be formed. However, when we get regression occurring after this transgressive sequence, we see fluvial processes overprinting a lot of the estuarine deposition. This is why we know that estuarine deposition and preservation dominates during transgressive events. Now let's talk about estuary stratigraphy. We've talked about the geometry, the processes, the deposition, but what about when we walk up to that outcrop, what are we going to see to make us know that this was an estuary environment? This is a strat column showing, showing the progression from further onshore from the bay head to the central lagoon to the estuary mouth to further offshore to the beach, etc. We already mentioned that estuarine processes and deposition are dependent on relative wave, tidal, and fluvial influence. This is also true for the sedimentary structures in an estuarine sequence. The estuary itself is typically dominated by interbedded sand and mud facies, and as you move to the beach and the foreshore, you get coarser grained sand, which finds throughout the shore face further offshore. Sure. Then moving landward, back moving away from the ocean basin and estuary, you get fluvial sedimentary structures along with coarser grain sediment because this is where the fluvial systems will dominate. A lot of help comes into identifying estuary environments in the rock record and pretty much any depositional environment in the rock record by looking at the adjacent environments. And by adjacent, we obviously mean in vertical succession with because of Walther's Law like we've talked about many times. These adjacent environments will tell you a lot about whether you're looking at a certain depositional system. Obviously, we don't always get that lucky, so sometimes we can only make inferences rather than drawing really firm conclusions. But just remember that when you're stuck and you don't know what depositional system you're looking at, try moving further down section or up section to the point where you see something totally different and interpreting it. Because if you're trying to interpret the system as, for example, a shore phase environment, and then you move to the adjacent system and you see Eolian deposits, it might not be a match and then maybe you'll have to go back and reinterpret your section. But again, remember that sometimes with erosion you have unconformities and missing time, so that could be possible. But when you get lucky and you have adjacent environments, use them to your advantage. With that, thank you so much for watching. I hope you learned something today about estuary, classification, geometry, processes, and deposition, as well as a little bit about the stratigraphy you might expect for an estuarine depositional environment. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.